Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming back to Thermodynamics here at RIT in the summertime. This will be our first full lecture. So there were a couple of lectures that we posted that were kind of prep work. And before we get into the new material or the material that's in thermodynamics proper, I just wanted to give you a basic overview of the thermodynamic concepts we talked about in those prep lectures. So we start off by looking at the universe, right? This is really a class about how the universe works. So our big blue blob here represents the universe. And we're going to split the universe into two pieces. So we have our system. That's the part of the universe that we're more interested in. And the surroundings, which is everything in the universe that's outside of our system. So when we're doing thermodynamic problems, there's a couple questions we're always going to want to ask ourselves. So the first is, what's in the system? So do we have some sort of mass? What type of mass is it? Is it water? If it's water, is it ice? Or is it liquid water? Or is it steam? We want to know where the boundary of our system is. And if that boundary allows us to pass mass, into and out of the system. So we need to know if the system is open or closed. We want to know at some certain time, maybe T0, how much energy does our system have? So we talked about in the prep lectures the idea of fixing a state or finding two independent intensive properties like temperature and pressure. So if we know temperature and pressure at time zero, then we know how much energy is in our system at time zero. Then we'll look over time and we'll say, well, how much energy is in our system at some later time, tau? Now, if I know these two things, I know the change in energy in my system. The cool thing about thermodynamics and about being a mechanical engineer is that we can then design a system that takes us from point A here at time zero to point B at time is equal to tau. And the process or the, the machine that we design will perform a transition between these two points that gives us some amount of heat and some amount of work. And our job as an engineer is to design a system that will give us the desired characteristics in terms of heat and work. So we know how much energy is transferred by looking at the state points at the beginning and the end of our process. But the process itself will tell us how we walk between those points or how much heat and how much work we have. So in this upcoming lecture, we're going to talk about work and how we figure out how much work was done as we move between these two points in time in this case. So our first lecture here, which is our fourth lecture, if we include the prep lectures, talks about work and about power. Now you might remember that power is the rate of work being done or work over time. So I think it's really important, right? This is thermodynamics. Right, so maybe the first big concept we have in thermodynamics is the first law of thermodynamics, right? And you know it must be important with a name like that, right? So the first law, it's kind of important. And my, what I'm, we're going to say moving all the way through the course is that if you ever get stuck on a question and you're not sure what you should do, trying to do the first law or trying to apply the first law to whatever you're doing is never a bad idea. So the first law of thermodynamics is really about conservation of energy, right? And if you looked it up in a textbook, it might say something like the change in the amount of energy stored within a system during some time interval is equal to the net amount of energy transferred into the system by heat transfer from the surroundings during the time interval minus the net amount of energy transferred out of the system on its surroundings during the time interval. So maybe it's because I'm an engineer, but I kind of don't like this definition. It's, it's way too wordy. It's really hard to understand exactly what's going on here, right? So one of the things, because we know another language, right, called mathematics, that will allow us to say this in a much easier way. So the first law of thermodynamics 
tells us that conservation of energy follows this equation here. Right? So you might be wondering, well, what, what does this equation mean? Right? So we have delta E. So E, capital E here, which tells us that this is an extensive property, which depends on the mass. So the more mass, we have more energy. This is the total energy contained within the system at a given state point. So in this case, as we move from one to two, right, E2 would be the energy in our system at that time is equal to tau. And E1 would be the energy in our system at time is equal to zero if we go by the diagram that we showed on that first slide. So here the subscripts tell us that if we're talking about a process that, that's changing in our control volume over time, then state one and state two are different instants in time where our energy is measured, where we're measuring those two independent intensive properties like temperature and pressure. Capital Q is heat transfer into the system from the surrounding. So when we look at the wording here, this tells us that heat into the system is positive, right? Because Q is equal to heat transfer into the system. Again, we have subscripts here, and this subscript says as we move from one to two, so you can't have heat transfer at any particular instant, right? Then you'd have a heat transfer rate but here you're looking at how much heat is transferred as you move between states one and state two. Finally, we have W, the network done by the system on the surroundings. Again, here the subscript as we move from state one to state two. So when we look at this equation, it tells us that our system originally has some amount of energy E1 then we're either going to add some heat. So if we have heat in, so if Q is positive, that means heat is transferred into the system. And if we look at our equation here, it kind of makes sense. So if we add heat to the system, we want heat in to be positive. So if we add heat, Q will get bigger, which means if we didn't have any work in our system, if it was only heat transfer happening, then E2 would have to be bigger than E1. So as heat enters the system, it increases the energy in the system at E2. And the opposite is true. So if heat is, if Q is negative, so heat is being transferred out of the system, we're reducing E2 provided that work is zero. We can look at work this way too. And the way this equation is written because it's Q minus W, our sign for work works in the opposite way as Q does. So now if work is positive, this is work done by the system on the surroundings. So work is positive when energy from work is leaving the system. The system is doing work on the surroundings. And work is negative when it work is going into the system. If we think about a balloon here, when you're pushing air into the balloon, you're doing work on the balloon, right? That's work into the system, and that would be negative. So if you're talking about the system doing work, so now you take that balloon and it's full of air and you set it up and you put maybe a computer fan in front of the end, you know, you, you let go of the end so the air shoots out. Now it's going to spin the blade on that fan. So that's the system doing work on the rest of the surroundings, right? This computer fan. So that would be work being positive. So it's a little bit tricky when we talk about the first law here for closed systems because the sign convention is different. Heat in is positive, but work in is negative. And we have this um, funny little mnemonic device that we use. We call it, we say hip to win. So hip is H-I-P, Heat in is positive, and win is W-I-N, or work in is negative. So that's how we remember the signs for the first law here. Eventually, after we do our process, and we have some amount of heat transfer and some amount of work, the energy in the system 
will have changed, or maybe it stays the same in a very special case, but we have some energy at our state too. And if it's a closed system, typically this is uh, things are changing in time. So this is our first law. We have that E2 minus E1 is equal to Q minus W. Now this equation works as long as there's no mass coming into or out of our system. Schematically, the first law looks like this, where we have heat coming in, and that would increase E2, and we have work going out. And when work goes out, we're decreasing E2. Now you might be thinking that this, um, this sign convention that we have is really weird. But I think sort of the, you know, for mechanical engineers anyway, when we started to think about thermodynamics was when we were looking at locomotives, right? And the way that a locomotive works, right, is someone shoveling coal into a furnace, right? And that furnace is boiling water. So we're putting heat into the system. Heat in is positive. And that's causing this water to boil and then it expands and that expanding water right as we get steam we force that over some fan blades and that's doing work so work out is also positive right so work in is negative but work out is positive so i think this sign convention kind of comes from these historic steam engines where we're burning coal heat in that's positive and we're getting work out and because that was what they were doing most of the time, then that's also a positive term, work out. But again, you don't have to think about this when you're doing it. You remember our mnemonic device that hip to win. So heat in is positive and work in is negative. So again, this is conservation of energy for closed systems. So if we think about how energy changes in a system, you might think about problems like this. Maybe uh, a girl, like one of my daughters, on a swing, right? Maybe you've seen cannonball problems or roller coaster problems. So you're familiar with this, this idea of conservation of energy, right? But what goes into capital E? So you know about gravitational potential energy and you know about kinetic energy, and these are two different components that we can put into our capital E. But we can also store energy in a spring or in this picture in a bow and arrow, right? A bow and arrow is just like a spring. When you pull back the bowstring, what's happening is you're storing energy inside the, the bow staves. So as you do that, it's acting like a spring. And then when you let go of the string, then that spring sort of springs into action, I guess. And the arrow flies off the string, right? So you're imparting kinetic energy. So you're changing that potential energy into kinetic energy. And these are kind of problems that you've probably seen before, or at least could think through given your understanding of physics. But maybe what's different about this class is that we start to think about thermal energy, right? Or energy that's stored internally in materials. So here we have some hot pieces of metal, right? And you can see where the hot part is. But here, where the temperature is higher, where this is glowing hot, there's potential energy or there's this internal energy that's stored in the material because of its temperature. So I could take this hot piece of metal and put it in some water and that could boil some water potentially. And because that can boil some water, I could use the steam to do some work. So there's definitely energy associated with this increase in temperature. If you want to think about this at maybe a, mon a molecular level, you could think about there's molecules inside this material. And as the temperature's increasing, those molecules are vibrating faster and faster, right? So there's extra energy that's stored up inside this material at that point as we increase its temperature. And it's also true for pressure. I don't have a picture for this, but as you store a fluid under more and more pressure, then that's more and more work that you could do. So you could think about, um, you know, we talked about a bike tire or a car tire in the preliminary lectures. And it's a little bit like as you're, as you're 
putting more and more air inside your tire, you're increasing the pressure. And that pressure represents some stored energy as well. Where if you open the valve stem, that would change into that pressure, that stored energy from pressure would turn into kinetic energy because the air would rush out of that valve stem. So if we're trying to think about an equation for capital E or the energy at a particular state, we can add up all the different kinds of energy that we can think of. So in the examples that I've given, we have kinetic energy, which we're probably familiar with, potential energy because you put something up high, right? So that's more like gravitational potential energy. There's potential energy that you can store in a spring or a bow. And then there's this internal energy so we can store energy in a material by increasing its temperature or by increasing its pressure so that's e the subscript i just says we could do this at any state or if we're thinking about a process that's moving in time we can look at the total energy at any particular time so e sub i is the total energy in the system at some particular state Ke is kinetic energy, so that's how fast your mass is moving. Potential energy is so gravitational potential. How high are you above some certain reference point? Sp spring energy, right? So how much energy is stored in a spring? So do you have things that have uh, deformed elastically that will move back to their original position when the force is released? And then we have this thermal potential energy or internal energy storing energy in a mass by way of its temperature or its pressure now what we're interested in the first law is how this energy changes over time or as we move between states so e2 minus e1 is the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy plus the change in spring energy plus the change in this internal energy So if we wanted to expand our equation for the first law, we can change this delta E term into several different delta terms, right? So the change in potential and kinetic and spring and internal energy. And it's important for us to do this because in, in several problems, we won't necessarily know enough information to find all these different components. So we'll try to use our physical understanding of how big each of these terms are to sort of see which ones are the most important. And in a lot of the problems we're going to do, almost all the problems we're going to do, it's really this change in internal energy that's going to dominate, that the change in U is going to be so much bigger than all these other things that we might as well think of them as being zero. This is kind of the concept of infinity or one over infinity, right? Infinity is not really a number. It's something that we use to, uh, to talk about the relative difference in size between things. So if something is infinite, it's like saying it's so much bigger than that other thing that you're thinking about. Uh, that other thing might as well be zero. So you already know about the first law. It's just you might not have heard that it's the first law. So in engineering mechanics or in you know undergraduate physics, you may have seen something like this, right? But we started off with this same equation, but we made some assumptions that maybe they didn't even tell you you were making. You didn't even know you were making these assumptions, right? Which is sometimes dangerous in engineering. So we want to track the assumptions that we make. So one of the things that, that we thought about or maybe didn't think about in engineering mechanics was that we have a negligible, negligible change in internal energy. I, we didn't even know what internal energy was, so hopefully the change was zero. We didn't know about heat transfer, so that was probably zero too. So in those cases, we get a simplified version of this equation where if we wanted to find the work, we would add up the change in kinetic energy, the change in potential energy, and the change in spring energy, and then we would be able to get the work that, was, um, that happened from the process that we did to our system. So in thermodynamics, we won't be making those same assumptions because actually internal energy and heat transfer are really important in thermodynamics. 
Remember that the definition of thermodynamics is that we're taking heat energy and turning it into work. So understanding heat transfer and the energy that's stored in mass because of its heat or its temperature and its pressure are kind of important. Right? So it's not reasonable to make those same simplifying assumptions in thermodynamics. So we have to keep all of these terms. Or at least we, we're really interested in this delta U term and in this Q term. So we might end up actually neglecting some of these terms because in the processes that we're talking about, like a nuclear power plant, where the biggest changes in energy are because you're boiling this water, then it's kinetic energy, potential energy, and spring energy maybe don't matter as much in comparison to delta U. So we talked a little bit in the preliminary lectures about the definition of power. So power is work, which is energy, divided by some interval of time. So we can talk about power, right? And we can sort of show that mathematically as W dot. Now, this dot is a shorthand for telling us that we're taking the derivative of something with respect to time. So whenever you see a variable that's something dot, or at least almost always, when you do heat transfer class, there's some weird sort of things that we do. But typically when you see W dot, what it means is the same as uh, DW by DT, right? It's like taking the derivative with respect to time or the change in that parameter, in this case work, over some time interval. Right? And this is basically saying that same thing in calculus that we would take sort of the limit as delta t approaches zero. So just a simple example here. We have a process that produces one joule in two seconds. So what's the average power output? So the work is one joule and we're producing. So that's work out, right? Remember, work in is negative, so work out must be positive. So that's plus one joule, and we're doing this in two seconds. So we get a half, or 0 0.5 joule per second. And if you remember, anytime we have joules per second, that's watts. So this is 0 0.5 watts. So that's nice, but a lot of times we have more complicated problems. Maybe something like this. So I'm definitely not advocating this as you're quarantined at home. But if you think about something like a potato gun. So there you have a PVC pipe. And it's got some kind of cork in it, right? Like a potato. And what happens in these things, I'm guessing, I've never used one myself, is that you, you do some sort of chemical reaction inside the pipe. Or maybe you're feeding it pneumatically. So you increase the pressure inside the pipe until eventually you overcome the static friction from your cork and that blows that cork out, right? So now you have a projectile, a cannon, right? That's why this is not a safe thing to do, right? But if I pull the pin here and I'm not adding any mass, I have some initial pressure here. But when I pull this pin and this piston starts to move, my volume changes. And because my volume changes, Remember, pressure is like we take these molecules and we push them really, really close together. But if the mass in my cylinder is not changing and my piston starts to move, those, those molecules, they start to spread out more, right? And as they're spreading out, what that means is that the pressure in the system is dropping. So here, the force here, right? So I know that um, pressure is force over area. But what that means is that if I want the force, I could take the force on this piston and multiply it by, or I could take the area of the piston and multiply it by the pressure, right? Because I get force over area times area, and I'd be left with force. I'd know what the force on the piston was. And if that force was constant, then it'd be pretty easy for me to find maybe the acceleration and then the change in velocity of that piston. The problem here is that as the piston starts to move, the volume changes and the pressure starts to drop, which means that my force changes as my piston moves. Now you might be looking at this and saying, uh oh, that means we got to do some calculus, right? Because we're looking at math 
for a system where our variables are changing with position or we could think about this as changing with time as well so here we would pull the pin and our piston would start to move and the force as it's moving is decreasing with time right because force is pressure times area if i'm in uh units if i'm thinking about the metric system then this would be pascals times area which eventually would give me newtons or if i was thinking about this in imperial units i would get pounds force per square inch or psi multiplied by square inches and then i'd be left with pounds force so we can have some pretty good confidence in this equation but because we have to use calculus here really what we want to do is uh, if we want to find the work right so work is force times distance and because the force on the piston changes with the position of the piston we have to do some calculus here so i need to know the force as a function of x and then i can integrate that over x from the initial position to the final position so here if i'm thinking about this is work right so this is like a force term multiplied by dx is like a distance term so here i can check my units again and if it was uh, metric uh, my force term would be in newtons my distance term would be in meters i get newton meters which is joules and if i was talking about pounds force multiplied by inches that's distance then i'd get inch pounds which is also a unit of energy so how would i do a problem like this so i take my force term so i need to get an expression for the force as a function of x where x is this position of the piston so i know that the force is the pressure times the area right and the area here that the for it's the area that the force is acting on so in this case it's the uh, the contact area of my piston so here i would get that work is the integral of p times a and in this case the area is constant because sort of the cross section of the piston doesn't change as it moves so pressure times area times this infinitesimal piece of x as the as the piston is moving so here i get p a times dx but a times dx is really so here if we draw this out right so we have some cross-sectional area multiplied by some small distance dx right so this is really a times dx is actually a differential volume which is what i'm trying to show in this picture that this is actually a small volume so i'm going to change this to be more generic because i could have a case maybe it doesn't look like this but i could have cases where my area changes with position and then i could rewrite this work term as the integral of p dv as i move from some initial volume to some final volume now just in case you don't trust me right we're engineers right which is kind of like being scientists so we should always be skeptical right trust but verify so one of the ways that you can verify what we're doing is checking the unit so i'm saying that this is pressure times volume will give us a work term so here my pressure is in newtons per meter squared or pascals my volume is in meters cubed and if i look at this then my meter squared cancels out and i'm left with newton meters newton meters is of course the definition for joules i can look at this in imperial units as well and i get psi times cubic inches to make it easier then my square inches cancel out and i get inch pounds which is also a unit of work so hopefully you know your confidence in me is getting stronger here because we at least can't prove that my equation is wrong right it's also in the textbook so that's a a good vote of confidence i hope so particularly when we're talking about closed systems the way that we'll find work is with this integral so the integral of p dv and if we're trying to evaluate it we need some initial volume and some final volume so this is a very important relationship p can be constant or it can be some function of the volume we can analyze arbitrarily 
arbitrary cross-sectional areas of volumetric expansion and compression. So we don't need the cross-sectional area to be constant when we use this equation. Even though in our derivation we did show kind of a constant cross-sectional area case. We do need, in order to, to calculate work this way, we need to know the pressure as a function of the volume. So we usually have this as, uh, that follows this form, that pressure times volume to some exponent is equal to a constant. Which means that if I divide both sides here of V to the power of N, then I would have pressure as a function of volume. So often we'll be given some value of N for a particular case. So one of my favorite ways to do calculus, right, is if n is equal to 0, because if n is equal to 0, v to the power of 0 is equal to 1. So then I just have a constant pressure system. And if my pressure is constant, that means I could take it out of my integral term, and I would just have pressure times the integral of v over this range, which is just p times delta v. So if it's constant pressure, work is just p times delta V. So now we have an example of a problem where we're going to do pressure work. So here the question asks us, a gas contained within a piston cylinder assembly expands in a constant pressure process at four bars from one volume of 0.15 meters cubed to a final volume of 0.36 meters cubed. Calculate the work in kilojoules. So here we need to know pressure as a function of volume. But it tells us here that the piston cylinder assembly, piston cylinder assembly expands in a constant pressure process. So the pressure is always four bars. Now remember that a bar is almost an atmosphere, but an atmospheric pressure is usually 101.3 kilopascals. And because it's metric, we don't really like that unit because it's not a kind of a round number. So bars are 100 kilopascals. So a bar is almost an atmosphere, but it's in a kind of a nice round denomination. So our known information in this problem is that we have a constant pressure process. So P is equal to constant. And we know that that constant is four bars. A volume is, volume one is 0.15 meters cubed, and volume two is 0.36 meters cubed. We're required to find the work in kilojoules. So I want to try to draw a schematic. So my schematic might look like this, right? This is just the same schematic we did before. We're going from V1 to V2, and I have a system here where somehow this pressure is being kept constant. So if I was drawing this out, then I would say as I move from my initial volume, which is 0.15, to my final volume, which is 0.36, then I have constant pressure. So sometimes it's helpful to draw things out on a PV diagram because remember that integral that we're going to do, the integral of PDV, is just the area under this curve. So... I can do some calculus here and we'll do that, but if you prefer to solve these kind of problems geometrically, you can do that, at least in some cases, because the area under this curve is going to give us our work. So here we're going to try to state and justify our assumptions. So here we're told that the pressure is constant. We're going to assume that, um, that this system is close to frictionless, or at least that the work that we're losing by friction as our piston moves through our cylinder is really small compared to the total work done. So we're going to say that it's equal to zero, but really the implication here is we can neglect it, which means that it's quite small compared to the other terms that we're going to be talking about. We're also going to assume that this system is a closed system. And the reason that we have to assume this is that if it's an open system and mass is coming in and out of our system, then we have to use a different version of the first law. 
So in this class, up until about the first exam, we're going to only be talking about closed systems. So we're going to talk with the first law, the version that we're talking about in this class. So now we're going to try to calculate the work here. So we remember our governing equations, in particular, that work, as we move from our initial to our final state, is equal to the integral of P dV. Now we're working in metric units here, so I just want to make sure that my equation makes sense, that there's no kind of conversion factors that I need to put in here. So if I turn my pressure into Pascal's, which is Newton's per meter squared, and I multiply my volume, which is meters cubed, then I would get an answer in Newton meters or joules. So let's try this. So work is the integral of P dV. I know that the pressure is constant. And because it's constant, I can take it right out of the integral here. So the P comes out, and I get that work is equal to pressure, which is a constant, times the integral of dV. This is my second favorite kind of calculus. The best math is when the answer is zero, but the second best kind of math is when we're doing calculus of a constant like this, because then this integral of dV is just delta V. And we take the final volume minus the initial volume, so now we have an equation and we know all the information. So I can put my pressure in here as four bar multiplied by the change in volume and my volume is given in cubic meters. Notice that I'm keeping the units in all of my calculations here because I wanna make sure that I don't mess up the units and get some kind of answer that doesn't look very physical. So here I see that I have four bar multiplied by 0.21 cubic meters. Now bar, this doesn't really make sense. Bar times meters cubed. I don't know what that is. So I'm going to turn bar into Pascal's. So I know that one bar is equal to 10 to the power of 5 Pascal's. Or if I wanted, I could say 100 kilopascals here. But I'm going to go right to Pascal's or Newtons per meter squared. My bars here cancel out. So this is how I always remember how to do this fraction when I'm doing unit conversion. I want to get rid of the bar here in the numerator. So I got to put the bars in the denominator over here, which means that my Pascal's has to go on top. Now here, if I take my cubic meters and divide by meters squared, then I'm left with just meters. So now I have 84,000 Newton meters. I know that 84,000 Newton meters is 84,000 joules, because again, I can do sort of this simple unit conversion here that one joule is equal to one Newton meter. So here, uh, my Newton meters cancels out and I get 84,000 joules. But the problem wanted my answer not in joules, but in kilojoules, right? I guess here, I so I canceled out these Newton meters, right? So I want an answer in kilojoules here. So I know, again, I want to get rid of this term of joules. So I put the joules term on the bottom. So there's a thousand joules here and I put kilojoules in the numerator. Now the joules cancel out. I divide by a thousand and I get 84 kilojoules. Now the last part of our solution method is that we're going to validate what we're doing. So let's check the units. That's something that we can always do, even if we don't have some kind of physical understanding of the problem. So we checked the units through all of our calculations and we got units that we were expecting. We were looking to get work and we got work. So the units we got were in kilojoules, which is what we were expecting. The final solution also gave a positive value. So I know that hip to win tells me that work in is negative. But this is work out, right? Because the, the system is expanding. It's pushing our system, which is the air inside of our cylinder. It's pushing that cylinder out. So the system is doing work on the surroundings. If work in is negative, then work out is positive, And we got a positive value here. So if we do the integral correctly and we go from the initial time to the final time, you should always get the sign right. But it's always good to check this, right? So we did get the right units and we got the right sign because our the air in our system is doing work on the surroundings.
So here, I don't particularly have an intuition for um, what the magnitude of the work would be done here. I, I'm not familiar enough with these um, piston type problems to say like, oh yeah, that makes sense that that'd be 84 kilojoules. But I do know that the unit analysis made, sen made sense and I know that the sign of my answer was correct. So I can't tell you that 84 kilojoules is the right answer, but I also can't prove to you that it's wrong. And if I got a unit that didn't make sense as energy, or I got the sign wrong, then I would be able to notice this right now. And that's sort of the benefit of checking like this at the end of a problem. So again, we end up here with a high degree of confidence in our solution. So that's the end of our first full lecture. I'll also try to split this lecture up. I'll have the whole lecture up, but then I'll also split out the problem at the end of the lecture in case you want to watch that by yourself later. So thank you, and I will see you again next time on Thermodynamics.